Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? My name is Kevin Smith. I'm Deputy Director of the Half and Refer Museum of Anthropology. I wanted to welcome you all here tonight. If uh, you're here for Richard Wilkes' talk, advertised behind us, you're in the right place. Otherwise, please stay anyway, because we'd love to have you with us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Half and Refer Museum of Anthropology has been part of Brown University for 55 years. We try every year to bring eight, uh, eight to ten different programs to the campus, uh, exploring different anthropological and archaeological issues of interest uh, to particular classes, to faculty, to us, or to others. This is our last program of this term, and we're glad to have you with us tonight. I just wanted to remind you at this point that if you have cell phones, please do turn them off. Uh, there's nothing more disruptive than having somebody's crickets go off in the middle of a talk or aliens. Um, I'd like to turn over the, uh, the podium to Jessica Lineweaver, Assistant Professor in Anthropology, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be here to introduce Rick Wilk, who's the Provost Professor of Anthropology at Indiana University, where he spent most of his career. Most of his research has taken place in Belize, where he's worked for more than 30 years. He's also worked in the US and West Africa and possibly elsewhere as well. Um, his scholarly, he's worked in many, many places. His scholarly activities uh, over this period have been supported by many granting organizations, National Science Foundation, Winter Grant Foundation, Fulbright Foundation, Tinker Foundation, many, many others. And he's also worked as a bona fide applied anthropologist with U UNICEF, USAID, USDA, Cultural Survival, and many others. So you can see he's been very busy. And if he looks familiar to you, it might be from his appearances on PBS or Discovery Channel, where he's appeared to talk about household archaeology in Belize. Or it might be because you hang out in the Belize Supreme Court, where he's also appeared to give advocacy, to give testimony on behalf of Mayans involved in land claims. Um, his publications are shockingly large in number. He's written more than 125 um, chapters in books and articles. Um, He's also written an important textbook in economic anthropology. He's the author or co-author of I May Have Lost Count, something like 15 books, I mean, a large number of books. Uh, his most recent book is co-authored with Livia Barbosa, the Brazilian anthropologist. It's called Rice and Beans, A Unique Dish in 100 Places. And over his career, he's written on many, many things, including indigenous Mayan farming, the household and family organization, environment, sustainability, television, media, beauty pageants, and the global food system. And his book, Home Cooking in the Global Village, won the Society for Economic Anthropology's book prize in 2009. Professor Wilk is also the director of the Food Studies Program at Indiana. And he and a colleague were recently awarded Mellon Sawyer Seminar funds to develop this program even further. He is truly a model for big tent scholarship. His anthropology extends over the course of his career across archaeology, cultural anthropology, economic anthropology, and applied anthropology. And then his work in food studies spreads that even more broadly and brings him into collaboration with faculty in biology and business and communications and geography and environmental studies, to name just a few. So it's a great pleasure to welcome him here to Brown, and I look forward to your talk very much. Thank you. Boy, right, thank you for that generous introduction, Jessica. You kind of made me tired just listening to all of it. Um, I want to start out tonight um, with uh, an arrow, this one right here, um, because I'm an anthropologist. I'm not a professional historian. And I'm certainly not a historian of the United States. And there are a lot of people working on food history in the United States. And this is not my profession by any means. So I'm not trying to trample anybody's territory here. I'm kind of an amateur on this topic, but largely because uh, I'm doing work right now, ethnographic work, with contemporary Americans on their food habits. And I'm trying to understand the roots of what seems to me to be a remarkable um, attitude and behavior towards food in our country. Um, something that we largely don't see because it's right in front of our face. Um, you know, as uh, George Orwell said, the hardest things to see are the one things that are right in front of your face. It's like uh, fish don't perceive water because they're swimming in it all the time. 
So let's start the, the history with this picture right here. Um, this is a posed picture that was um, created by the DuPont, DuPont Nemours company in 1950. Um, DuPont was trying to figure out what they were going to do after World War II to get into the American marketplace. And um, this was the beginning of one of their bright ideas, and that is they took an American family and they posed them in front of everything that a family of four ate in the year 1950. And if you look at this, you notice some really interesting things about the American diet in 1950. Some things that actually DuPont was very much aware of. Um, and that is, well, for one thing, this is all milk down here. So they were prodigious milk drinkers. Um, and uh, there's a lot of shortening and butter here as well. Uh, we got a lot of chickens, and that's the form they bought them in. They were not wrapped in plastic yet. Uh, they were still recognizably dead animals. Um, and there's a lot of pork, beef, and uh, there's even a couple of fish hanging there. Uh, a lot of hams. Americans were still big eaters of salted pork. And um, when you look at this, what I think um, I, I can pour over this picture for hours because I find it so interesting, but what I find striking is that there's so little processed food. Almost all the food here is whole food. Even the stuff that's canned is basically just canned peaches and canned tomatoes. And the closest thing you've really got to a processed food is cornflakes up here. Um, and when they're eating vegetables, they're mostly eating fresh vegetables. When they're eating fruit, they're mostly eating fruit in season. Um, and don't forget the sweet tooth. There's a lot of sugar here and a lot of flour because they were eating a lot of baked goods, as well as uh, buying a lot of store-bought bread. So the other thing that kind of sticks out to me when I look at this picture is how incredibly bland that diet was. Because when you think about it, most of the meals they're eating are boiled or broiled or fried meat, starch, and a vegetable. The kind of inevitable triad uh, that Mary Douglas defined as the English um, sufficient meal uh, back in the 1960s the basic grammar, something brown, something green, something white. But what I find really peculiar is that, that we've got that meal of relatively bland food that's being cooked in a nation largely composed of immigrants who came from places where the food had very sharp and strong flavors. So what happened to all of those sharp and strong flavors? Um, and what happened to all those thousands of distinctive immigrant cuisines that those people brought with them to the shores of the United States um, as part of their voyage of migration? Well, I think a very instructive story is the story of the eel. Be it's interesting, especially because for the Americas, it starts almost right here in Rhode Island. Um, Anguilla rostrata, the American eel. When the pilgrims showed up here on the shores of New England, one of the things that really delighted them was to find that one of their favorite things in the world to eat was abundant. In fact, huge eels crowded the rivers and streams of North America, especially in New England. And um, they ate them in wild abundance because um, in Europe, smoked 
pickled, broiled, boiled, steamed, any kind of eel was considered an extremely rich food and largely a kind of elite food because they were full of fat and fatty meat was especially valued in Europe. Um, and today you can go to Northern Europe and you can go to Germany or Holland and now even being revived in England uh, are eel shops or places where you can buy smoked eel. And um, these are just a few of the eel um, gigs that were developed here in New England for this express purpose of spearing eels in the rivers and streams uh, in fall and winter when they congregated. And um, there were so many of them, they said, that you could basically use one of these like a pitchfork uh, and bail them into the boat behind you. Um, and uh, that's uh, a contemporary picture uh, from some eel fishermen in uh, North Carolina. But you know, eels are not a big fishery anywhere in the United States. Adult eels today for local consumption. 95% of the eels that are caught in the United States today go either to Europe or they go to China. And most of them go to China. They're caught about uh, a foot long. They go to China where they are put in uh, fish farms where they're fed fish meal and grown until they're about two and a half or three feet long. And then they're split, frozen, sent to Japan where they are cooked um, and treated with this nice uh, soy based, soy and sugar based sauce, and then frozen again and shipped here to the United States where you eat them in sushi bars. <laughs> I kid you not. They do, a, they do a complete circle. They start in the United States and they have to go to Asia before we will eat them. Um, there are some even stranger commodity circuits where fish caught in the United States are sent to China to be gutted and filleted and then sent back, but I won't go into that. So how is it that America, one of the largest eel-consuming countries in the world in the 1880s and 90s, becomes a non-eel-consuming country by 1920? One of the things that we love and that used to be one of our favorite and most abundant sources of food, in the space of 20 years, we not only forget that we loved it, but it becomes something that we shun. When I was a kid and I went fishing in Long Island Sound, if I caught an eel, people told me, kill it and throw it back as a lesson to the other eels. <laughs> it's like a, a trash fish, you know, and they're evil, like other trash fish. You have to teach them a lesson. <laughs> My great-grandparents, who migrated to the United States from uh, Galicia, which is now part of Ukraine, and, uh, and Ruthenia, now part of Lithuania, and, um, well, they came here in the 1860s and 70s, and these were their favorite foods. Um, they ate dark bread, they drank shav made from sorrel and chicken broth, they made their own pickles at home, they ate borscht at least four or five times a week, and they quarreled amongst themselves about what was the right way to make borscht, whether it should have meat in it or not, and how much sour cream to put in it. They ate pickled and salted herring in many different varieties, and they ate a lot of stuffed cabbage. And my grandparents, my who were raised in this country, didn't eat this stuff. In fact, 
They were not taught any of the languages, six languages that they, each of their parents learned and spoke. They were, Amer they were raised as Americans. And they were raised specifically not to like this stuff, except on kind of secret family events, but certainly not to eat this stuff in public. Instead, they joined um, an American dietary, uh, how can I put it? They entered into a stream of American dietary faddishness, which by the 1870s and 1880s was beginning a process of squeezing all the flavor out of American food <laughs> in the hope of promoting a less restless youth who would be more, who would be less likely to play with their private parts. <laughs> and, there, and therefore would be less likely to bring hell and damnation down on the United States <laughs> as a country. Most of what was wrong with the United States, according to these great reformers of diet, could be traced to eating bad things in excess and not chewing them enough. So the great masticator, Horace Fletcher, <laughs> recommended not just that you chew everything a hundred times, but that you actually chew the things you drink. So that if you drank water, you should chew it before you swallow it. Something I have tried to do and failed. So, Fletcherizing means to keep, to chew your food thoroughly. <coughs> Sylvester Graham, who gave the name to the Graham Cracker, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, promoted vegetarianism, mastication, eliminating spices, because all of these things raised the passions. And all of these things that raised the passions ran the danger of raising the wrong passions and basically <coughs> making young children want to masturbate. And these same people, I mean, this was a s considered the major public health crisis in the United States in the late 19th century. And this was a time when parents would come in and there were little devices to keep the children's hands above the covers. Um, and there was intense supervision because this was seen as something that brought disease and corruption into the home. And it was directly tied to diet. Now, you may think that this was some kind of fringe cult, but basically what these people did was they took a country that was used to sitting down to a breakfast with at least four kinds of meat and six kinds of biscuits and maybe, sev and maybe several kinds of fish as well. I mean, the breakfasts in the mid 19th century were enormous and people really sat and worked their way through these huge breakfasts. And by the time these guys were finished, people were sitting down and eating bowls of whole grain doused with a little bit of milk and chewing it a hundred times. <laughs> one of the great changes in uh, one of the first of the great kind of mass changes in diet promoted through changes in ideology connected with religion in world history. And incidentally, something that took diverse kinds of immigrant diets and in the name of public health, taught these people that their food was unhealthy and led to very bad public health outcomes. Now, there was something else that was going on in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century, besides the fact that um, war was looming on the horizon 
the United States was under assault from foreign terrorists. Foreign terrorists of dark complexion who came from Eastern Europe. Our president, William McKinley, was assassinated by one of these terrorists, the first American president to be assassinated by a foreigner. Before that, we just had domestic terrorists. Um, and who were these people? They were, you can't read this, but it's anarchism. Anarchist terrorists from Eastern Europe. There were lynchings of Eastern Europeans in many parts of the country in the uh, leading up to and during World War I. During World War I, there were lynchings of German people. Many German people changed their names. People stopped eating Germanic food. People stopped breeding, buying, and selling uh, dachshunds. Uh, German shepherds became Alsatians. Uh, there was a, literally, a, Germans were considered potential traitors. It's when Frankfurters became hot dogs. And this notion that immigrants and foreigners were kind of invading the United States in this symbol of the round bomb with the smoking fuse. People did not want to be seen eating foreign food. Foreign food was a danger. And this led to a period which some scholars have called the great blanding of American food. And there's a number of different things that led, that contributed to this. We see the rise of giant food processing companies, both in meat like Swift and, the net, and in uh, convenience foods like the National Biscuit Company. Um, we see the rise of home economics and the professionalization of nutrition as a discipline which the universities played a very strong role in, particularly the land-grant universities. We see wartime austerity in World War I. And for the first time, Americans from many different parts of the country living and working together in a single organization that fed them all the same rations. And uh, a kind of growth of a sense that there was a common uh, diet, a common American diet and experience um, that came out of this experience of Americans as doughboys, doughboys going, uh, going abroad. And at the same time, the emergence for the first time of a national food system with uh, long distance transportation of canned, chilled, and, and increasingly frozen food from places like the Imperial Valley in California, uh, from places like uh, Georgia and Florida, and uh, the beginnings of a system that broke down people's uh, allegiance to, to um, seasonal eating. Let's not forget the homogenizing effect of the Depression in World War II as well. So when you're thinking about that picture, that initial picture of that family surrounded by whole foods in and bland foods in 1950, remember that they're coming off the experience of the Depression followed by World War II. And a depression when Eating luxurious, exotic food was kind of an insult to the people who were not able to eat anything. Well, it, we were a country with bread lines and massive unemployment and soup kitchens. And I know my grandparents, my grandfather was a doctor and he did fine during the Depression, but they did not eat ostentatiously because they felt like it would be morally wrong. Um, I think they did sneak out and have a lobster a couple of times a year. 
Um, but they, uh, I, I think there was a sense of restraint that came about through the depression. And I know in the experience of, that the experience of going through the depression changed that, that generation's attitude towards food in a way that lasted for their entire lives. And we also see at that time a homogenization that it, that's involved with the, the movement of people to California and the massive movement of people from the south uh, to cities in the north that went on during World War II and, and during the Depression. And along with that, we see a kind of mixing up and loss of regional identities and local cuisines founded on local special foods. And the rise of convenience foods, ready prepared foods, which cut down on the amount of time that women who were still stuck with most of the domestic tasks, even though they were working outside the home, uh, were taking advantage of to cut down on their, their, their domestic workload. So that's where we end up here. This is not some kind of primordial position. This is the end point of a long process of blanding and nationalizing of the diet. So where does it go from here? Peter Menzel has done us the favor well, he's done us many favors through his photographic work. I use his work all the time in my teaching. And in Hungry Planet, he gets families around the world to pose with a week's worth of food. And he figures out how much it costs. But I was looking at, looking at these pictures, and you know, it's clear, of course, so much of it is processed. And so much of it is in boxes and, and in plastic. There's so little food that's recognizable as a food object. In there. You know, there's no whole animals. There's, there's a few whole fruit objects like bananas and grapes over here, but they're uh, clearly in the minority. And this stuff has had to be unwrapped so that you could see what it is. But the more I looked at it, the more I started to think that, you know, it looks more like a Toys R Us <laughs> than it looks like a grocery store. And that's really what got me thinking about the rest of the talk. It got me thinking about the way in which food has gone from being um, a vehicle for nutrient, for, for nourishment, to becoming part of the entertainment industry. Because these foods are not just meant to get nourishment into our body. These foods have become essentially forms of nutritainment. Here's another American family. And look at the colors. There's nothing food-like about the colors, even of the food. <laughs> you know, so you look at the colors of the pizza, and frankly, you know, it looks like, it doesn't look like anything that a, a person of 100 years ago would recognize as food. It looks like some kind of an artificial plastic object. Um, and everything else is brightly colored and wrapped and has kind of, it's, but they're almost in alarm colors. You know, if I was a biologist, I would be, I would kind of be saying, well, wow, some of these are like, don't eat me colors, you know, <laughs> unpoisonous colors. And I don't think that America is unique in that regard. You know, here's one of Menzel's pictures of a Japanese family. And if you've been to Japan, you know that not only does this wrapper have not have food inside, it doesn't. It has another two or three wrapped things inside. And those wrappers have wrapped things inside. You know, you may have to go through like five layers of wrapping before you actually find the dry recipe that you're confused. Because, um, Wrapping, of course, part of very ancient
ancient part of Japanese culture, but it's been adapted and appropriated by the Japanese processed food industry into you know, an industry where you could basically um, produce an entire basket full of wrappings from a single dinner. Yeah, yeah um, there are some whole fish here, um, and, um, and there are some whole fruits, but there's an awful lot of packaging covered with bright colors and covered with advertising. And uh, in ways that are appealing, again, I think, to a sense of fun rather, to a, rather than to a sense of um, eat me, I'm nourishing. So this is kind of the way I define nutritainment rather than nutrition. Nutritainment is a system where eating food has gone from something we do to get nutrition into our body to a kind of performance where bright colors and bright shapes and funny names and characters are associated with the food we all know about food porn, where there's actually a pleasure in watching, you know, where there's, a, where there's a kind of voyeurism attached to watching other people cook and watching other people eat um, as much as there is to eating yourself or cooking yourself. So there's a kind of displacement of agency. Um, and, um, and then there's not just food that's packaged to look like toys and toys packaged to look like food and you know mini, mini baked ovens that cook stuff that's kind of like food but you probably don't want to eat too much of it but there's also toys in the food and there's food in the toys so that the boundary between food and toys is completely disappeared and you go to the, to the McDonald's and you get a fun meal which is completely indistinguishable. And I even saw a commercial where the parents get a babysitter to leave the kid at home so they can go have a fun meal at McDonald's together. You know, so that it's kind of like um, the experience of being in a fun place and having fun with the food has displaced the act of eating completely. And then I was thinking about the way that cooking itself has become like so many other activities in consumer society. You know, you, these days we assemble our furniture, you know, we assemble our house. Do it yourself. Everything is do it yourself. So cooking is just like do it yourself. That's all there is to it. It's just become another part of the kind of reassemble it, the, how can I put it, the um, placing back on the consumer the responsibility for much of the prep work that used to be done by professionals. So in the guise of turning us all into craftspeople. So, but what kind of prep work is it? It's mostly just dumping stuff in bowls and pouring measured stuff in and mixing it and putting it in a in the oven. That's not cooking. That's just dumping, that's just mixing and putting in the oven. It's, it's like doing your checkbook, you know. It's not really um, a craft or an art. Ah, so, how did we get there? How did we get to Nutritainment? I collect these books from the 50s. I have hundreds of them. And I didn't really know why I was collecting them until recently, when I finally found that I had a use for them in, uh, in giving this lecture. And um, in the 50s, and I remember this because my mother was one of these women who came back from a brilliant career and uh, got married right after World War II and then found herself stuck as a suburban housewife with screaming kids in the house and pretty much 
no friends and no work and going slightly crazy. And it turned out that her job now was to entertain her, the kids and entertain her husband by food performance and entertaining uh, the kids entailed being a real mom and doing all of this interesting stuff with mixes and with um, teaching your children how, well, proper gender roles, of course, and taking the ingredients that were pouring out of this kind of vast cornucopian system of uh, late uh, uh, of um, industrial agriculture and recombining them in new ways to make an incredible variety of things out of hot dogs and canned peas and especially cream of mushroom soup and gelatin and all over America, people were experimenting with molds and rings and jello salad. You guys, most of you are too young to have experienced this as a, as a child. But believe me, many of us had to eat this stuff. <laughs> and come home and find that, you know, Indeed, beanie weenies had appeared in like a new form in the house. And, or a, a hot dog salad. This is like one of over a hundred hot dog salads that are in this particular book. Um, Laura Shapiro has a wonderful book about this era called Something from the Oven which really explains in much better detail than I can the kind of involuted gender dynamics of this era of the stay-at-home mom who is supposed to perform a kind of ent themed entertainment miracle by color coordinating fun. I mean, isn't it fun when you can like get new dishes and have like a green where everything is going to color coordinate green, and then you can have like the hot dog being the beanie weenies um, served in some kind of special green bed of something <laughs> there, um, or maybe with a Seven Up salad from the Seven Up cookbook, um, or. <coughs> Who knows what that is? <laughs> but the point is, this is not food. It's not supposed to be food. It's fun. You're supposed to be having fun. And, and by the standards of the 50s, this was domestic fun. I mean, you didn't have to have a crab. <laughs> All you really needed to have was some rice and some cream of mushroom soup and green peas and, and, and some breakfast sausages. And you could kind of make your own crab. See, it's creative. And what the food industry did was it responded by turning food into a consumer good just like other consumer goods that worked on a fashion system with constant innovation and planned obsolescence. So that in this country, we now consider it perfectly normal that every year, 15 or 20,000 new food products are introduced and maybe two or 3% survive at the end of the year. And that one of the functions of the food industry that occupies the efforts of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of creative people is to develop new ideas, 
like, you know, putting the sauce in the can of pork so that mom can then just open the can and squeeze the sauce out and put the pork on top. Uh, clearly an idea that di didn't work then, but who knows? <laughs> Could be coming around again to a store near you. And new food products, whoever kind of thought that food was going to become a, a part of the fashion system this way. But just like, <clears throat> just like clothes and, and just like shoes and just like any other kind of consu consumer electronics, we've kind of naturalized this notion that food is novelty and we should be seeing new kinds of food all the time. Just think about all the variations of Oreos that have appeared in the last 10 years. You know, there's probably an, well, I know in upstate New York, there's a museum where this guy tries to collect all these foods that have come out and failed. And he can't keep up. You know, the, um, and there's a guy in London who also has tried to collect stuff for his food museum. But the problem is that the cans start to, gr you know, explode after 15 or 20 years. And now he has to empty the cans. And no one is kind of keeping track of the composition of the stuff. So this is all ephemera. Nobody studies it. Nobody's looking at it. But this is the stuff of our civilization. You know, and it's ephemera. It comes and it goes. And until I saw this advertisement, nobody could have ever imagined never have imagined that someone saw that. Well, the other thing that they did for us during this era was they totally displaced the real economy of people who produce food and replaced it with a cast of characters from Hollywood and from the imagination of advertisers so that our food no longer came from people who worked and sweated and earned wages. Our food came from Chef Boyardee and Aunt Jemima. And everybody recognize these guys? <laughs> it's amazing how many people, you know, still recognize. I mean, Shirley Temple, an early celebrity um, of Rice Krispies, the Jolly Green Giant, who not only became an advertising figure, but actually had an imaginary, he came from an imaginary place, right? The Valley of the Jolly Green Giant. But a real place decided that they would name themselves for the imaginary place. So there's an actual place now in Minnesota called the Valley of the Jolly Green Giant. So life imitates art, I guess. And Babe Ruth, I mean, so all of these imaginary and celebrity endorsers appear in between the consumer and the producer and completely displace the producer. And instead of our food coming from, well, and of course, let's, let's not forget the figures who bring us our fast food, our, our fast figures. Um, because, you know, in a new era, we, uh, we have these people cooking for us and bringing other stuff. But um, they also bring us stuff from imaginary places. So instead of our food coming from a real place like the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> no, our stuff comes from Nature Valley. Um, and our beer comes from the Plank Road Brewery, which is an imaginary brewery invented by the Miller Company to try to convince people that their beer produced in giant factories comes from a real bunch of guys, you know, running a small craft brewery somewhere where they bought the, they actually 
bought a small brewery that had gone bankrupt so that they could have the name. Um, and who, you know, who could ever forget that there was once a real place called Pepperidge Farm? You know, where was it? I don't know. But here's, yeah, here's the Valley of the Jolly Green Giant uh, in Minnesota. Um, and uh, don't get me started on where the bottled water comes from. Um, I have a paper on bottled water, and it's one of my um, favorite things to yell, up, yell about. Um, now, just in case you didn't think that, you know, I hadn't made my case that food had become part of the entertainment industry. Let's not forget that we're the only country, well, not now, but we started out as the only country that had a professional eating circuit where you can actually make your living as a professional eater in the major league eating circuit. And these are people who make a living downing large amounts of hot dogs. Um, and I mean, really, let's not forget, of course, that there's professional cake competitions and professional, I mean, we, this is not new. People have been doing pie competitions at, at um, you know, county fairs for a hundred years. But that was for like a blue ribbon. Now there's real money in a cake competition on TV because not only do we have cake competitions, but we got celebrity chefs. Um, in fact, in Bloomington, Indiana, where I live, we have two celebrity chefs who have actually cooked against each other on TV. And this has caused a rift in town. <laughs> in the food scene in town between the advocates of the two chefs. And we have a lot of professional food journalism. There's a, there's a food entertainment, I mean, just like any, like the movie industry or the TV industry or the sports industry, just like any entertainment industry, food has got all of the trappings of an entertainment industry. We've got food celebrities, we have food book fairs, we have people who make money going to food book fairs and writing up food book fairs on their food book blogs. Um, and we have people who report on food fads and fashions. Um, not to mention that we already have food awards and it's not gonna be long before we have a food hall of fame. If we don't already have a food hall of fame, I'm sure that there's someone right now who is got, trying to sell one to a small town somewhere in America, probably upstate New York where many of these halls of fame end up. Maybe Cooperstown needs another hall of fame. Um, but there, there should be a food hall of fame if, if food is truly a, a, an entertainment industry. There, there's, there's like 25 bread museums in France. So there should be at least one food hall of fame in the United States. Um, now, interestingly enough, at the same time that food has risen to become the peak of entertainment, there are also basically anti-food deniers who are doing their best to do away with food as part of their lives at all. So, uh, this is, uh, this is Gamer Grub. Um, Gamer grub is basically food that has been pelletized so that you can ingest it while you're gaming without interrupting your game. <laughs> and they actually make a hopper feeder for gamer grub that attaches to the side of your head so that you can just fill the hopper with gamer grub and you have another one on the other side for liquid. So you can get gamer grub out of one side and liquid out of the other side. You don't have to stop. And I understand that there are also devices to carry away your wastes so that you just don't have to get up. Um, 
And now there's also a move entirely away from food for children as well, because you never know if you're actually feeding them the right diet. So to be sure, you should be giving them pea grow, which is a balanced, chem well, chemical, but, it, but mostly natural chemical, um, <laughs> mix of all the essential nutrients that your child needs in a day, color-coded for their different ages. So that you, from a box of Pedia Grow, you can be guaranteed that your child will grow up completely healthy with all the necessary nutrients. So here we are in the early 21st century, and what we have now is this massive industrial food system built on the, these industrial principles of providing all of our food as entertainment. And we have this other system of green food and local food and sustainable food, all of it presented to us as an alternative. And the question that I have at the end of the talk is kind of the question that is posed by Warren Belasco in his very um, thoughtful and prescient book, Appetite for Change. Um, it's a book about the counterculture of the late 60s and early 70s when there was a very strong movement towards rejecting industrial food I mean, this is when Celestial Seasonings got started and Dr. Bronner was everywhere. And when many of us in college had our first flirtation with macrobiotic diets and vegetarianism. And um, what he says in this book is that rather than being something new, this kind of anti-industrialism, this kind of agrarian communitarianism has been a constant theme in the United States. It's always been there as a counterpoint to industry and to urbanism and to fads and fashions. It goes away, it seems to go away, but it never goes away completely. That we've always had our shakers and we've always had our, uh, our agrarian philosophers like Wendell Berry um, and like um, David Thoreau, who have been arguing against um, industry and for more direct experience of nature. Um, and um, what he says at the end of the book is, every time when this counter movement arises, it ends up being co-opted and it ends up being essentially um, another trend in the, um, in the marketing of food. It just ends up being another, um, uh, well, and think about Ben and Jerry's as the example. It ends up being just another flavor. It ends up being the green flavor. Uh, and the industrial, uh, the industrial system just keeps rolling on. Um, and I end up where, uh, where Warren ends his book, and that is, how is it going to be different this time? And the difficult question that he asks is, how do we make it different this time? So I think I've used up all my time, and um, if there's time for questions, I'd be glad to take them. Except that I don't have an answer to this last one. I should let you know.
Well, thanks. Um, there's a really good paper in, um, I think it's in human ecology from a couple of years ago about the community and school gardening movement in the US in the 20s and the 30s. And I was just totally shocked to find that every single school in New York State had a garden in the 20s. That there was a, a very strong movement that uh, was based on the idea that school kids were not learning where food was coming from and they needed to see that happen in their schools. Uh, so there was a, a big movement to get gardening into the schools and that somehow in the late 20s and early 30s um, that dropped out in a period, you know, as the Great Depression cut back on school budgets. Um, so I think um, getting at the question is going to be how it gets institutionalized, you know, and, uh, and you know, can people actually make a living as an urban gardener, I think is something that's still kind of up in the air. Uh, yeah. Well, in uh, the last 40 or 50 years, we've had fresh vegetables available to us year round. Now that picture you showed at the beginning from uh, DuPont in 1950, I was a teenager then, and so I have some experience of, of this kind of thing. In the winter time, I was in the Chicago area, and in the winter time, you didn't have any fresh foods available. You had either canned goods or frozen, and they all had a lot of salt in them. Yep. So it was quite a different diet, and, and you were suggesting, it seemed to me, that in the 1950s this was no longer true, but it was. It was true up until probably at least 1960. But since then, we have had fresh vegetables year-round, and it has made quite a difference in a diet that uh, no longer has to be either frozen or canned, and you do not have the salt in the diet that you once had, which I think is an important point. Yeah, I was not trying to actually say that um, that 1950s diet was um, uh, was an all you know that they were getting their foods all all year round. Actually, that was um, mostly seasonal fruits and vegetables that they were eating. Um, at the time, you could you could get out of season fruits and vegetables, but they were really expensive, and most people didn't didn't see them. Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, not so much a question, but a couple of comments, uh, unfortunately, because I maybe know too much about some things, although I thought the, the talk was fabulous, and I learned a great deal about things I didn't know anything about. Um, the one projection that uh, had the pictures of the logos of uh, fictional characters and so forth associated with brands, um, it made it appear as if Aunt Jemima suddenly appeared full-blown, Oh, in no. the 50s. No, she goes which way She goes back. back to about 1909 and was a creation of the yeah. J. Walter Thompson Agency. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that I found a little misleading about uh, sort of convenience type foods uh, being available for housewives during World War II, I've just completed a book which is now being looked at seriously by a university press. Uh, the book is on uh, how the American public cooked and ate during World War II under the exigencies of rationing. Uh, price controls and so forth, and uh, in doing so, I uh, looked at over a thousand, more than a thousand, photocopied ads from uh, the major popular magazines and women's magazines. And aside from things like canned soups, Campbell's soups, um, a rudimentary, very rudimentary beginning for uh, Chef Boyardee, in which the spaghetti was separate; it was actually sticks of spaghetti and a canned sauce, and a very a prototype of Kraft macaroni and cheese. There weren't any really prepared foods to speak of, and when you get to the canned soups and stuff, they were had such high ration points yeah. that most women were making their own soups anyway. So I don't really think that you know the the, the canned convenience thing was really more a product of the post-war years, and even Rosie the Riveter was coming home and basically coming home from the airplane factory or the war plant and cooking from scratch by and large. I think that was still pretty much the way of the world during the war years. 
Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. It was. You can pull that down, probably. Oh, okay. uh, well, first of all, your talk was fascinating. Well, um, thanks. I was told many, many times growing up in Fairfield, Connecticut, that the land that used to be Pepperidge Farm was, in fact, right there in my town. Um, <laughs> and I also have a question for you. Um, I was wondering what you think about the trend toward aligning gourmet with imported foods and how so many of our, uh, our foods that we perceive as like fancy and ultra, ultra gourmet come from other countries. Mm. Yeah, we had a really interesting um, talk. We had um, Wes Jackson uh, from the Land Institute uh, and Wendell Berry at IU last year. And uh, I and the food studies graduate students got to sit down and talk with them about this notion of local food and this idea that they've been kind of pushing for a long time that you should know the people who produce your food. And I've, I've often been, I've been long concerned with when kind of food localism turns into food xenophobia. Um, and, um, and they admitted that we're never going to do without coffee and bananas. But I think you're absolutely right. The things we should be looking at, rather than coffee and bananas, are probably things like caviar and uh, foie gras. Because um, the things at the high end rarely get very much scrutiny. And I think that they probably do a lot more damage in terms of um, ecology uh, than many other things. The problem is that because they tend to be very high value, you tend to find that the people along the commodity chains um, are very well protected because they can kind of afford to pay everybody off. Um, so it can be very dangerous. It's kind of like investigating drugs it's very dangerous to start messing with the commodity chains for things like black truffles because it turns out that the people that their people are secretive information is hard to come by nobody really wants to talk about it people with guns start hanging around at the interviews you know and it's um it's generally difficult um so I think in, ge you know, in general, people are much more willing to think and talk about coffee. Well, it is you know, one of the largest trade items that goes from south to north, and it does have a huge impact. And you know, if you want to talk about damage, palm oil probably does more than anything. Thank you. Sure. First of all, I want to thank you for coming this evening. Yes, and, my pleasure. Um, as, as a member of the, the Food Studies Program at your University, I wanted to ask you what do you feel is the position of food studies within the, the discipline of anthropology as a whole? Mm. Yeah, well, we're having a conference in May with a bunch of people from different disciplines to get together and try to figure out where it's going and what's happening because um, food studies programs are popping up in a lot of different places with a lot of different formats and um, there's really nothing particularly systematic about any of it and we've been in kind of loose touch with each other and w I think we need to get our act together a little bit better some of these programs are in anthropology. Some of them are more interdisciplinary, say at uh, 
NYU, it's it's more gastronomy uh, based in a program that started as nutrition. And you know, there's good arguments for keeping it in a discipline, in a traditional discipline. There's also good arguments for kind of going it going out into the world of X studies and trying to, you know, build an identity as a as a new subdiscipline. But it's also a time when the academia is under a tremendous amount of pressure and innovation is being, I think, um, squeezed. So um, it's kind of, we're right now, we're kind of confused about whether this makes it a really good time to try to innovate or a really bad time to try to innovate. And we get kind of mixed messages at our university. So um, I, I'm, what I see though is that students everywhere are really interested. And they're not interested in the disciplinary fights. And there's a real need for something that integrates um, production and consumption and looks at food in a holistic way. Um, because the way the discipline's divided up right now just makes no sense. Just the way the way government divides it up right now makes no sense. You know, why should soup be regulated by one government agency and beverage be regulated by another? It just makes no sense. You know, if it's a little thicker, you know, it just makes no sense. So it's a great question. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. I wanted to ask, you talked a little bit about the, the women in the 1950s and how they were forced to be creative and entertain because of their boredom. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> it's a way oversimplified. I'm sorry. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what was going on with restaurants at that time and mm. how, like, the broader idea of food in this country, was it the same as what was going on in the individual homes, or how was it different? Oh, boy, that's a big topic. Uh, and, you know, the history of restaurants and restaurant culture is really fragmented, so I'd have to think about that for a while. You know, I really like uh, Psyche Williams Forson's book, uh, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, because she, um, she kind of looks at the way that um, uh, restaurants for a lot of black women were a means of survival, even though they were marginalized, um, and how for a lot of uh, poor communities, owning a restaurant was a very, was like that and and hair were really the only two ways that women could be economically independent. And when I look at immigrant communities today, you know, it's remarkably the same today um, that restaurants and hair care and cosmetics are still two really important institutions that allow immigrants entry. Um, 50s restaurant culture, too big for me, too big a topic for me to answer. Great topic for research, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. A thousand meatloaf blue plate specials. Eating out instead of eating at home. That's often the same thing. Yeah. Eat out now. I want to invite you all to a reception over at the Happen River Museum's gallery just across the green. We've got three varieties of hot dog salad. Crumbled up onions on top. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.